The first t-test that we are going to learn about is called the independent samples t-test. And the independent samples t-test will allow us to compare the sample mean from one sample to the mean from a second sample. So the independent samples t-test is a parametric procedure. This means that both of the samples are drawn from populations. And this will allow us to do our parametric testing. So it's going to test whether two samples are statistically significantly different with the assumption that the samples are independent. That means that the scores in one sample do not influence the probability of scores occurring in the other sample. We're comparing, let's say, men to women. Think about which one you are. If you're taking a test and you score in a certain way, does that influence anyone else in the other group? No. Your scores are independent of the other group's scores. So if we're comparing men and women, what we would have then is a mean and a standard deviation for each sample. We could calculate the mean and the standard deviation for the men and compare it to the mean and standard deviation for the women. Now the t-test is testing whether the means of these two samples are different. But the standard deviations of the two samples should be approximately equal. And we do have a way of testing that because if that assumption is violated, we could have some problems. Let's then talk about the assumptions for the independent samples t-test. First of all, the samples must be independent of each other. This isn't a before, after setup or something where we've consciously paired groups together. The samples are independent of each other. And they should be either randomly assigned or naturally occurring. So your independent variable, the groups, should either be randomly assigned, maybe something you do as part of your research design, or we could take naturally occurring independent variables, which are sometimes called pseudo-independent variables, and we could compare, let's say, men to women. So why are men and women not randomly assigned? Because you are one or the other, and we take you as we find you. Your gender is naturally occurring. We don't do anything to manipulate that. Now, the sample sizes for the two groups should be roughly equal. We have about the same number of men as we do women. If we have a few more or a few less, that's okay. But they should not be vastly different sample sizes. Sometimes this comes in with our research design, where we're trying to compare a group of people who are sort of uh, rare in their occurrence. So let's say we were studying sociopaths who are locked up in prison. There's not as many of them as there are the general population, and so trying to compare sociopaths in prison to the general population, the sample sizes are not going to be anywhere close to equal. What we would have to do is change our research design. We'd have to find another group that is more comparable to the sociopaths in prison, it's like, uh, like Congress or maybe corporate CEOs, something like that. Our dependent variable has to be at the scale level. And this, there's no negotiating. It must be at the scale level. If it's not, we can't use an independent samples t-test. We'll have to use a non-parametric alternative. The scores on the dependent variable should be normally distributed. Now, sometimes the scores are not normally distributed or they're mostly normally distributed. However, if we have enough subjects, then the t-test is robust meaning that if this assumption is violated, we can still use the t-test. It is robust to violations of the assumption of normality. However, it is only robust if you have a large enough sample size. So you need to have at least 30 subjects. If you have a small sample size and the scores are not normally distributed, you're probably going to make an error. And finally, the populations should have homogeneity of variance. The variability of each of the two groups should be approximately equal. So let's break down that phrase, homogeneity of variance. We've learned about variance. For our purposes, we're going to use standard deviation. As you know, standard deviation and variance are really the same thing. One's just the square root of the other. Homogeneity. What does that mean? Well, the word homo means same. And geneity, or genus, or genetics... That has to do with nature. So homogeneity we could understand as being of the same nature. Therefore, 
homogeneity of variance means that we have the same kind of variance in each group, or the variance in each group is approximately equal. Great. Now, how do we know that? There is a test called the Levine's test that will allow us to know whether or not the variability in one group is approximately the same as the variability in the other group. So Levine's test tests whether the variances of two samples are approximately equal. Now remember, this is our assumption. We are assuming that the variances of the two samples are approximately equal. But that's the assumption of the test. We should also be careful because you know what happens when you assume things. We need to trust but verify. We need to make sure that those variances are indeed approximately equal. So we run this Levine's test, or more accurately, SPSS runs a Levine test for us, and we interpret the Levine's test based on its significance. Now, if the significance is greater than 0.05, then our Levine test is non-significant, and we can assume the equality of variances. So let's think about this. Levine's test is testing equality of variances, that the variances are approximately equal. And you remember, that's our assumption, or that's what we want to be the case. So the null hypothesis for Levine's test is that the variances are the same, that there is no difference in the variance of one group and the other. That's what we want. Well, if no difference is the case, that is a non-significant find. There is no significant difference between the groups. So in this case, when we're interpreting Levine's test, we like it when the Levine number is non-significant. That means that the equality of the variances can be assumed. If, however, we check the significance value for the Levine test and we find that it is less than 0.05, well, then there are significant differences between the variances and we cannot assume that the variances are the same or that they are approximately equal. So when we do our interpretation of our t-test, we want to check first to make sure that the variance or rather that the Levine test is non-significant. And if it is significant, we need to interpret our t-test slightly differently. You can find out more about Levine's test on page 12 of the Bayer handout. Now there's some other things you need to know about this independent samples t-test. Let's look at what a single sample t-test looks like. It's the mean of the sample minus the mean of the population divided by the estimated standard deviation of the population, or that S sub M. If we were to take two of these one sample t-tests and combine them, in other words, one t-test minus the other t-test to see if there is a difference, it would kind of look like this formula that I've given you here on the right. M1 minus M2 minus mu1 minus mu2 all over the estimated standard error of the mean. That's the S sub M1 minus M2. Now, sometimes, in fact, most of the time, we do not know the mean of the population from which the samples were drawn. We could estimate that value using the mean of the sample, but we don't know it. And this could be really, really bad. If you had to know the mean of the population, we could be in trouble. But remember what we're doing with hypothesis testing. We're doing a test that tells us the likelihood of getting a particular test outcome if the null hypothesis is true. And the null hypothesis assumes that the populations from which these two samples are drawn are no different or are the same. So if the population means are the same, if we were to subtract, subtract them, in other words, mu1 minus mu2, if they're the same, they should come out to zero. So what that means is that if the null hypothesis is true, then mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, and it drops out of the equation. And therefore, our t-test, our independent samples t-test formula, becomes a little more simple. Now I say a little more simple because there's something else going on behind the scenes that you need to know about, and it's fairly complex. It's called pooled variance. You see, we have two samples. 
two groups. Each one has its own variance. And if the sample size, if the size of those two groups is not the same, then the larger group is going to exert more influence on the test. Its variability is going to weigh more. So what we have to do is weight the variability by the sample size. This is called pooled variance. It's done for you behind the scenes in SPSS. But it is important that you know this is going on. The pooled variance is divided by the two sample sizes of n, and then we take the square root. The standard error of the difference between the sample means is the error term that we're going to use for this test. It's SE sub M1 minus M2. So as we look at the definitional formulas here at the bottom of the page, the variance is computed for each group using N minus 1 in the denominator. Those two variances are plugged in and pooled and weighted by the sample size. And then that is plugged into the standard error of the difference formula, leaving us with the final definitional t-test formula of mean 1 minus mean 2 divided by the standard error of the difference between sample means. So that's what's going on behind the scenes. Let's take a look at the test itself.